the famous stadiums of the football capitals of the world, the stars and the legends of the world's most popular sport have gathered to reflect on the nations and the teams that they're pinning their hopes on in the World Cup. Today, Paolo Rossi, Italy's player of the decade, looks at Italia 90, at the history and the tradition of soccer's greatest international event. He talks to fullback Franco Baresi about this year's Italian team and the opposition they will face. We'll hear from the journalists, the fans and the celebrities who bring so much colour and excitement to the world's greatest game. And now let's hear from a soccer legend, a man who really knows his game. Hello, I'm Paolo Rossi. Welcome to Italy and Milan, where, during the last century, composers like Verdi and Puccini made Italy a center of opera which was the envy of the world. But here in Milan, next June, voices will be raised in a very different song, as the curtain rises not very far from here, at the San Siro Stadium, on soccer's greatest event, the 14th World Cup. In June, 24 nations will compete in the final stages of the 1990 World Cup, the most important event in the recent history of Italian soccer. It will be greeted in Italy with the same enthusiasm that was shown in 1982 when, in Spain, Paolo Rossi became a world star in just two weeks. That World Cup fully revealed his amazing talents, particularly his ability to score vital goals. Six of them, more than any other player in the tournament, and all of them decisive. His goals swept Italy to the final with Germany, and after more than 40 years, Italy won the World Cup for the third time. Rossi, go! Rossi! Italia in vantaggio, Rossi! For one month every four years, the World Cup unifies the fans and the nations of the world. For a player, it's a totally unique experience. Thousands of miles away from one's own country, to represent his nation is enormous pressure and great emotion. But enormous pressure is part of the game. A player has to know how to put it aside and concentrate on his adversary game after game. This year the World Cup returned to Italy, and our national squad will endeavour to win its fourth World Cup competition. In this programme, we'll take a look at Italy's preparations for what has proved to be the most popular sporting event in the world. We'll review the history of Italy's involvement in this competition from the beginning up to the present. We'll hear from some of the heroes of these glorious victories. And with the national team sweeper Franco Baresi, we'll examine in detail the squad's key members player by player. Ciao Franco. Ciao Paolo. See you later. We'll look at some of the teams we'll have to face up to in June. Finally, we'll examine what makes soccer Italy's favorite sport and national passion. This guided tour through the world of Italian football through the ages is about to commence. My advice is don't miss a single moment. This program is the first part of a series of ten specials that will present the ten most important soccer playing nations in the world today. I'm proud to be part of a team of great players past and present who will host this special. Players who thrill us all with their talents. I will obviously introduce you to Italy. My colleagues in this World Cup discovery are players whose names you will know, like Franz Beckenbauer of Germany, Luis Dos Suarez of Spain, Roberto Falcao of Brazil, and other stars of each soccer-playing nation. I'm here at the magnificent arena of Milan. This arena, built at the beginning of the 19th century in Napoleon's honor, hosted the first international match of the Italian national team on a Sunday in May 1910. On that day, the Italians beat the French 6-2. It was the first of many Italian victories. Monti, 
The first great triumph came in 1934 when Italy hosted the World Cup and won it. They beat the United States and Spain, then beat Austria 1-0 in the semi-final in Milan. After that, the Italian team won the Jules Rimet Cup in Rome with Benito Mussolini, Il Duce, looking on. In the final, the Czech resistance was finally broken down in extra time when Schiavo scored to give Italy a 2-1 victory. But the fascist propaganda machine took the credit for that victory and used it to curry favor for the Italian regime. Four years later in France, Italy defended the title under coach Vittorio Pozzo. He was captain of the team which won the cup in 1934. Silvio Piola was Italy's new star, but the real strength of the team came from skipper Giuseppe Maiazza, a member of the 1934 team. He was regarded by many as the greatest player of his time. After a difficult match with Norway, two brilliant goals from Piola took Italy to a 3-1 victory over France. Thousands saw the surprising Italian 2-1 semi-final victory against Brazil. It opened the last door to the Italian team, to the final itself, in Paris, against Hungary. The vast crowd was expecting an exciting match, and they were not disappointed. The Italian team attacked right from the start, and they scored first through Gino Colosi. A few minutes later, Silvio Piola increased the Italian lead. The very sporting crowd began to support the underdogs, and the Hungarians scored twice. But Silvio Piola hit Italy's clinching goal, and Vittorio Pozzo could celebrate a 4-2 victory. It's not easy to find such high caliber players as you could then. In those days they weren't influenced by financial gain. The game of soccer was everything to them. They'd cry if they lost and they'd cry if they won. We Italians are very emotional, you know. Porta, porta, viola, sei sempre giovane e potente come allora. Porta, porta, viola. Vittorio Pozzo's fine team and the wizardry of Colossi and Piola had reconfirmed Italy as world champions. The date was June 19, 1938. But it was the end of an era. Several months later, Hitler's forces invaded Poland, and Europe was plunged into war. It would be 12 very long years before the world would witness another World Cup competition. This was a stadium in which Torino played, the legendary team that won five consecutive league titles and at one time was able to boast ten players in the Italian national squad. Here, in Stadium Philadelphia, Italian soccer was born again from the terrible ruins of the war. This squad has remained dear in the hearts of all Italians, not only because it was a great team, but also because it met a tragic end. One afternoon, the 4th May 1949, the plane which was returning them to Turin from Lisbon went down in the hills which surround the city. There were no survivors, and with this tragedy, Italian world-class hopes also disappeared. Candido Canavo, managing editor of Italy's Gazzetta dello Sport, remembers that tragic day. I remember. It was a very sad day. I was on a train in Sicily. We leaned out of the window at a station to buy a paper. 
That was the first we knew about what happened to the boys. What a tragedy. You see, the Torino team were like gods to us, the legend. They were one of the few nice things to come out after the war. It was hard then, and we were poor. For many years after the crash, Italian football was at an all-time low. It took a very long time to rebuild the faith and pride to put us back on top with a first-class team in international football. In 1950, the team sailed for Brazil. Onboard training had to be suspended. All the balls had been lost overboard. They didn't do any better on dry land either. They were eliminated in the first round. Giovanni Trapattoni, now coached to Inter Milan, recalls another sad World Cup, 1962, in Chile. Chile were a very strong team. They had great players who later became Italian nationals. They were so good on the technical side, they could face any team and keep fighting right to the end. I think what was happening on the field got to us. Our nerves were stretched and things went against us. The referee didn't help. He made one or two decisions which I think were unfair, very biased. Anyway, there were a couple of incidents on the field. Two of our players were sent off and we were eliminated from the championship. English referee Ken Aston later told friends that the tension in the stadium was overwhelming. There were 70,000 screaming home team supporters. The Italians were demoralized and depleted after Farini and David had been sent off. But Italian supporters claimed the obvious fouls of the Chile players went unpunished. The nine remaining Italian players held out for 70 minutes before Chile scored. The match, which was more of a street fight than a game, finally ended 2-0 to Chile. Italy were out of the tournament. Referee Aston later took a referee's supervisor's position, but never again refereed an international match. The 1966 World Cup in England was a dark period for Italian soccer. Gigi Riva, their great star, was left on the bench. He was afterwards one of the first to challenge that decision. I don't have any good memories of the 1966 World Cup. I was a young man, 22. I was in really good form. I could have been in the team. But they took me along as a sightseer, on the bench. Why, I don't know. I wanted to play, but what could I do? Many had considered North Korea were a weak team. They soon proved them wrong. The Italian team were in trouble. Having beaten Chile and lost to the Russians, Italy only needed a draw in order to qualify for the quarterfinals. Italy's manager, Edmondo Fabri, had decided to play the injured Giacomo Balgarelli in midfield. It was a gamble, but even with a bad knee, he was a player to be reckoned with. However, he finally had to limp out of the game, and they were a man short. The North Koreans had the advantage. That was all the edge Korea needed. Within minutes, dentist Park Duick scored. Furious Italian counterattacks failed to produce an equaliser. The unimaginable had become a reality. Italy had been beaten by an unknown squad of Oriental amateurs. Back home, Fabri was blamed for the defeat, and he suffered the fate of all losing managers. The symbol of Italian soccer's renaissance was Gigi Riva. Thanks to the formidable strikers' goals, Italy won the European Nations Cup in 1968 and achieved unexpected second place in the World Cup in Mexico in 1970. The 
the Azteca Stadium, Mexico City, June 17, 1970. The World Cup semi-final, Italy versus Germany. Italy surprised the Germans early on by being more adventurous than usual. After only eight minutes, Roberto Boninsegna put them in front. But then the Italians pulled back into their defensive shell. The Germans were unable to find a way through. But any hope of a German victory seemed lost. Tempers flare, but Uwe Zela urged his teammates to keep calm as time was running out. Then, in the 89th minute, a cross inside the Italian area landed right on Schnellinger's foot. Schnellinger's goal was just a lucky break. He thought the match was as good as over and was heading for the dressing rooms, which were behind the Italian goal. He was only there by chance, but we should be grateful to him. Without his goal, we'd never have played that unforgettable extra time. The Italians found it. Boninsegna down the left. Rivera. 4-3. The final in comparison was an anticlimax. Italy lost while Brazil won their third World Cup. Germany's big moment would come, but not for four years. In 1978, in Argentina, I played in my first match in the World Cup finals, and Italy did not disgrace herself, finally finishing in fourth place. But without doubt, the high point of my career in international soccer came four years later at the next World Cup in Spain. The 1982 World Cup saw Paolo Rossi's return to the game. Rossi had been suspended for over two years as a disciplinary measure. His return was awaited with skepticism by an Italian public who no longer believed in him. In 1978, Rossi had been the prince of Italian soccer. The athletic ability and technical wizardry he showed in the Argentine World Cup had dazzled the crowds, and Italy finished impressively in fourth place. In 1982, Rossi stunned the world with six World Cup final goals. A national survey rated this as the soccer performance of the decade. With three drawn matches, Italy received strong press criticism for only just getting through to the quarterfinals. But then things improved. With goals by Tardelli and Cabrini, the Italians scored a 2-1 victory over the world champions, Argentina. Italy's next battle was with the cup favourites, Brazil. Three goals from Rossi, plus a tremendous performance from Dino Zoff, the 40-year-old goalkeeper, gained a 3-2 result. Another two goals from Rossi in the semi-final eliminated Poland. Italy were through to the final for another confrontation with the Germans who hadn't forgotten the defeat 12 years earlier in Mexico. So the atmosphere was electric in Madrid's Bernabeu Stadium when Paolo Rossi's second half goal gave Italy a 1-0 lead over Germany. A few minutes later, Tardelli got another. Later, Altobelli and Breitner scored and Enzo Berzo's team were 3-1 winners. Italy, the tournament outsiders, were once again kings of world soccer. Of all their team successes, this is the one the Italian fans treasure most.
1982, during the television broadcast of every Italian match, the only thing to be heard was this voice. No traffic and no music, not even passers-by. Only this voice. It came from thousands of televisions and a shout of joy from millions of fans as they celebrated with one voice our magnificent World Cup victory. The city had become a stadium. Every Italian victory in the 1982 World Cup was celebrated joyfully throughout the country. From north to south, from the biggest cities to the smallest villages, Town squares were united in one great national festival. Italy's victory over the Germans in 1970, the extra time semi-final, is still called the game of the century. That night, the country exploded in a display of national euphoria, the first since the end of the war. Car horns sounded long into the night. Town centers were thronged with happy people, splashing in fountains, spontaneously expressing their delight in any way they could. Scenes like these have greeted every Italian World Cup victory and will be repeated in June. They've become the symbol of the Italian people's affection for their national team. But when Italy loses, the whole country mourns in silence. Their disappointment is deep. Whether as a reflection of national pride or just a release from everyday life, this intense reaction clearly demonstrates the power of this game. To excite or subdue an entire nation in just 90 minutes. I'm here with Franco Beresi, the sweeper of the national squad and one of the world's most noted defenders. Welcome, Franco. Ciao, Paolo. I'm sure our viewers would like me to get right to it and ask you to give us an analysis of the squad and in particular the part played by the defense. I'd say uh, the defense is the most dependable part of the team now, where uh, Coach Vicini has the most confidence. Um, for the last few games we've played well and given the coach the least doubt and uh, I believe he considers the defense the most efficient. The party trusts most. Okay, let's have a look. Paolo Maldini, left back, 21, the youngest in the squad. His father was in the national team in the 1950s. Paolo underlines the importance of his section of the side. I think the strength of the national team lies in the defence. There's an equal split between AC Milan and um, Inter Milan players. There's a good rapport and a good coordination. Together we're a very strong unit. Central defender Riccardo Ferri, hard and ruthless in the tackle. Most of the year he's marking other members of the international squad. It's good. At the end of the day, we're all wearing the same jersey. We put aside any disagreements which may have arisen during our domestic season. We're intelligent people. It's very important that we get on with each other, for our own good and the good of the national team. We're good friends, and we need to play together as a team if we are to win. Walter Zenger exceptional goalkeeper, one of the best in Europe. He feels more confident and relaxed with the support of the crowd in games at home. When the World Cup is held outside Italy, people say there's not a high level of support. The crowd are against us. When we play at home, people say the tension's a problem because all the support is on our side. I like the support on my side. Giuseppe Bergoni right back. Nicknamed Zio, the uncle. Captain of the team, and he feels he knows what it would be like to win the cup at home in Italy. I think it would be an incredible thing. 
I was on the winning side in Spain and it was good, but I spoke to Daniel Passarella, who was on the winning side in Argentina, and being Argentinian, it was an overwhelming experience for him. So if I could win again, just once more, but on Italian soil, that would be the greatest joy of my life. Okay, we've seen the defense. Let's work on the midfield. Well, I'd say the midfield is the part uh, where Vecini is trying various solutions where, uh, where he doesn't have a precise idea. He's got a lot of different uh, options and players he can use. So we'll see in his pre-World Cup phase what the best solution might be. So uh, I'd say it also shows a lot of promise. Okay, let's take a look at the midfield. Galdo Ancelotti, young and fearless, could add extra strength to midfield if given the chance by manager Vicini. He's very consistent in the ideas he's introduced, and he has succeeded in promoting the under-20s, which is to his credit. He's also been very lucky, and in this game, luck is a thing you could never have too much of. That's very important. Nicola Berti, a man of fiery character and determination. Impressive acceleration. He's not sure whether or not he'll be selected, but says he's ready to play. Well, I've got a lot more confidence. I've always played and I'm here like the others to do my best, in the hope that I'll be picked for the World Cup squad. Roberto Donadoni, gracefully gifted, constructive and excellent on the ball. He's eagerly looking forward to the World Cup adventure. Everyone's expecting a great deal from the national team, we know that, especially as we're playing at home. It's only fair, really. They expect us to be the heroes of the hour. The national team has a duty to play well throughout the tournament, that's quite clear, although winning the cup is going to be a tough challenge, but we'll give it our best shot. Roberto Baggio, the rising star of the national team. Technically brilliant, superb ball control, makes goals and scores them too. But he's unpredictable and manager Vicini has reservations. However, the Italian fans love him. Many compare him with Zico. He was a great player, tremendous personality. I'm only at the beginning of my career and I've got a lot to learn. Giuseppe Giannini, called the Prince of Midfielders by Roma fans. A playmaker with flair and natural talent. But he might feel uncomfortable alongside Baggio. No, there's absolutely no bad feeling between myself and Baggio. You could see that on the field this evening. He plays more upfield than me, I play further back. What's important is that Italy do well. Certainly the midfield is the part that will have some changes and coach Vicini will be examining one way or another different solutions. There are players who have to learn some positions which are a little different and maybe study some different strategies. But I'd say anyway it's possible to arrive at the World Championship at the beginning of the World Cup with a good midfield. But at this point I'd like to talk about the attack which is surely a very important very part important of the, the attack game. Because, uh, of course, it's a climax of uh, the game where we score goals. So anyway, uh, I'd say the only really sure player is Viali. The problem is to play alongside Viali. Coach is studying various alternatives. Um, let's hope that uh, we arrive at the World Cup with the right combination. That's all we can do, you know. <laughs> with someone who scores goals. That's what's important. Let's take a look at the attack. Aldo Serena, one of several strikers who could be chosen by manager Vicini to play alongside Viali. He's tall, strong and very good in the air. I hope I get picked for the Italian national squad because I'd really like to play in the World Cup. But of course, all the others have the same ambition as me, so I'll have to wait and see. I think the strength lies in the whole squad, all 20 players. There's no weak link. If Virginia has a problem, 
it's having so many talented players to choose from and deciding who doesn't play. I hope it's a happy problem for him, because with such a range he has the freedom to make the best choice. And he knows that whatever he decides, we'll all accept it with a smile. Okay, Franco, we've talked about the entire squad, but I think there's someone we've forgotten. You. <laughs> I know it's difficult to judge oneself, but... Uh, uh, I wouldn't know what to say. Uh, I'd say I always try to do my best, but it's up to the others to judge my performance, uh, to, s to say what I contribute, how I play. Personally, I'd say, if I had to give an opinion on Franco, I consider him one of the greatest defensive players in the world and that I've ever seen play soccer. Franco, last December 9th, the World Cup draw was held. Franco, they draw for Italy. What do you think? I think it went pretty well for us. We had uh, some good luck considering the other divisions. Uh, say our group is uh, a good one, uh, one that shouldn't give us too much hassle. America, uh, Czechoslovakia, Austria. Which of the three do you consider the most dangerous, the strongest? Well, lately we've played Austria where we won. But they definitely have a good squad, which played a good elimination round, and I'd <coughs> say they can pose some problems for us. Uh, Czechoslovakia is kind of an unknown quantity, but you've got to be careful, you know. It's a mistake to underestimate anybody at this level. And then a surprise, uh, there's the U.S. Uh, I think everyone is curious to see them play, the Americans. Okay, let's take a look at these three teams. For the first time since 1950, the United States have reached the final stages of the World Cup. It's an important experience in their preparation for the 1994 World Cup, which they will host. The USA team can't hope for great results in Italy, because they lack a world-class goal scorer. But their return to the game's highest level of competition is long overdue and well-deserved. And they have men of outstanding quality in players like Miola, Caligiuri and Vermes. Austria, and thanks to their coach, Joseph Hickersberger, they've at last come through a difficult period. They have several promising young players, but there are no major stars except perhaps centre-forward Anton Polster. But they hope to revive memories of the Wunder team of the 1930s. The pages of Italian soccer's history book provides a reminder that Italy has not won a game against Czechoslovakia in 37 years. The Czechs have a strong defence, guided by Chovanec. The midfield can count on talented players like Kubik. He plays for Italy's Fiorentina. But in attack, Dr. Joseph Venglosch, their coach, can't count on too many outstanding players. If Italy successfully get through the first round, they will sooner or later have to play against one of the other tournament favourites, Argentina, Brazil, West Germany and Holland. Argentina, the world champions, will be a major force. They rely greatly on the fantastic talent of Diego Maradona still considered by many to be the best player in the world. His ability and his goals were the outstanding feature of the last World Cup, when Diego unexpectedly led his team to final victory. As always, manager Carlos Bilardo had some difficulties in catching up with his players who were scattered around the world. Bilardo has called up Real Madrid's Jorge Valdano, the former left winger in the national side actually retired two years ago after a bout of hepatitis. If Valdano can overcome his problems and join the team, and Maradona produces his best form, Argentina have a real chance of winning two World Cups in a row.
Brazil are able to call many excellent players into their World Cup squad. Traditionally, they've always produced superstars in practically every position. In the past, Pele, Gerson, Rivolino and Zico. Today, they have Carlos Dunga, Silas, Ricardo, Giovanni, Alameo. There are men who strike with power. Careca, Bebeto, Romario, Muller. In protecting their goal, the Brazilian team employ a mixture of man-to-man -man and zonal defense, with two defenders marking the opposing attackers and a sweeper playing at the back. It's the system favored by manager Sebastian Lazzaroni. In their build-up to the World Cup finals, Germany have gradually built up a powerful side, which will offer a genuine challenge to everyone else in the competition. It's formed around their Italian-based stars. Matthias. Klinsmann, Brain. All three play for Inter Milan, and as Germany play first round matches in Milan, they'll look for support from Inter fans. Voller and Berto will likewise hope for the fans of Roma to be on their side if Germany reach the final in Rome. For Franz Beckenbauer, this World Cup will mark his final appearance as manager of the German national team. Nobody knows if Rude Hullit, the glittering star of the Holland team, will be fit to play in the World Cup finals. But Holland can count on two elements. The athletic strength of its European players, like the brothers Kerman, Van Tegelen, and Bosman. Along with the supreme technical skills of players like Rijkaard, Winter, and Vanderbilt. And there's Marco van Basten who now wears the mantle of the great Johan Cruyff. A striker with a deceptively soft touch, voted the best goal scorer in Europe in the last two years. OK, Franco, now let's hear from some of the fans who don't always get the chance to express their opinions on the team. We hope to reach the semi-final, the final and to win. A repeat of 1982. That's what every Italian wants. Italians are devoted to soccer and to their players. Of course, we want to see them play well, and we hope the cup will stay in Italy. That only seems fair to me. After all, Italy is the best team in the world. The least we have to do is to reach a good position in the top four. I'd be happy with that. We uh, naturally expect the team to play a great game in the World Cup, and I think they'll do it. I'm convinced of it. We've got a much stronger team than in 82. Much stronger. Oh, they were good players, but this team's even better. Baresi is the best. He's the best sweeper that's ever existed in the world. Come on, Italy! Come on, Italy! I hope we win, but it won't be easy. One thing is sure, the fans expect a lot from us, but uh, we all know that there's also the other team. Certainly, we've got a great responsibility. Especially since we're playing at home and uh, so the fact that we're favourites. Uh, but it must also be difficult to maintain your concentration in a moment when, uh, above all, an entire nation uh, uh, like Italy uh, expects so much from his squad. So what does a player do when he has to face that kind of psychological pressure? For sure, the world, during the World Cup, will be under a lot of pressure. High expectation from enthusiastic fans, and we've, uh, we've got to try to uh, isolate ourselves for this appointment, uh, for this competition, with maximum concentration and determination, I think. I agree with you completely, Franco, and we'll talk about this further when we return in a minute. When it comes to singing the praises of Italian soccer, there's one voice that stands out. I'm a stage performer. I used to be a footballer like most Italian men. So what do you think of that, huh? I think sport is wonderful, but I think football is special. 
Italian boys are born with football boots on. As soon as we start walking, the first gift we receive is a football. I can tell you that Quederas, Domingo and I are going to give a concert in the name of soccer. We'd never do that in the name of art because we each have our own precise identity in the world of art. But we're going to do it in the name of sport and specifically in the name of soccer. Football is football. It's quite simple really. You kick the ball and try to get it into the net. That's it. It doesn't take a great deal of imagination. There is also an intellectual approach because everybody who likes to talk about the game if they meet in the bar or wherever has their own opinions. They all have their own views on the finer points of the game. Why did he pass the ball? If he'd hung on to it, he could have scored. So-and-so should have done this or so-and-so should have done that. It is something which has grown out of the great rivalry between the different towns, different places. It is a sport which has great inventive power. You play with your feet, but you need inspiration, creativity, agility, the speed of an athlete, many, many things. And then, of course, there's tactics. It's tactics that give the game that thrill element. It's not always the best team that wins, but then that's the beauty of the game. Do you have any suggestions for Vicini? Vicini can make mistakes without my help. But I'm sure he will do his best. But at the end of the day, we should just have better players than the ones we've got now. You mean Italy is not one of the favourites? No, at the moment I don't think we are one of the favourites. But you can never tell. It would be very difficult to win the World Cup even though we are playing at home. We lack creative midfield players, and even the attack leaves a lot to be desired. Let's hope and pray that at least we can score a few goals and then perhaps we will win the World Cup. OK, Franco, we were talking about Italy as favourites, but in my opinion it isn't always the best team that wins. What I mean to say is it takes a little luck, some concentration, the right moment psychologically. Uh, what do you think? I agree with you. Uh, I think it's uh, the most important to arrive at the World Cup in top form physically and mentally. We have to prepare ourselves as best we can in the period before the Cup actually begins. And uh, naturally, uh, what is helpful is that measure of luck. OK, Franco, it looks like it's time to go, but I'd like to express my best wishes to you and to the entire squad. And I guess it goes without saying that we all expect to see you guys in the final in Rome. <laughs> Thanks for the encouragement. Let's hope we don't disappoint the fans. And, uh, as we said, uh, we've got this responsibility to win. Let's hope it all goes well. Thanks. And thanks for having joined us on the program. And thanks to all of you who've been watching the program. I hope you've enjoyed the show as much as I've enjoyed presenting it. Thanks a lot. Best of luck. And we'll see each other soon at the World Cup. So until then, take care. See you soon in June in Rome. And finally, long live Italy. Go for it, Italy. Come on, boys. We can do it. We can do it.
program is part of a fabulous collection which tells the complete World Cup story from Uruguay 1930 to Italy 1990. There are 10 parts in a series no true soccer fan can afford to miss. All the great moments in World Cup history can be yours to enjoy forever. Captured with dramatic action pictures and interviews with the stars involved. Enjoy again Pele's first World Cup. Was he the greatest of them all? Or is Maradona with his hand of God even better? How do the great European stars wait alongside those two Latin legends? Franz Beckenbauer led Germany to glory in 1974. Johann Cruyff inspired a generation of treats from the Dutch. Michel Platini sparked a French revolution in the 70s. And Bobby Charlton was the shooting star of 1966. Marvel again at their brilliance in the World Cup story. Would that glorious Brazilian side of the 60s still be the best today? Did Jeff Hurst's third goal for England in the 66 final really cross the line? Decide for yourself. And who will win the cup this year? Find out why Bobby Charlton and 1986 top scorer Gary Lineker say it could be England. Paolo Rossi and Franco Baresi go for a home win, but will Italy's cast iron defense stand the heat? Can Maradona work his magic again to give Argentina the trophy for the third time in four series? The legends of the past, the stars of the future, they're all in the World Cup story. Yours to enjoy in your own home. Available now wherever videos are sold.